What I'm showing in this graph are values for four different samples, and these values can be anything you want. For example, it could be the breaking strength of a part, and the sample could be the formulation of different parts or different types of alloys, for example. It could mean something like the weight of people, and the four samples could be different nationalities, for example, or different age distributions, perhaps. It could represent the yield of crops, so the average height of plants, and the four samples could be different fertilizer types or different fertilizer concentrations, for example. The values could represent air pollution concentrations, and the four samples represent different locations. The values could represent maybe a chemical conversion in a reactor, and the four different samples are four different catalyst types or maybe four different catalyst concentrations, for example. What an analysis of variance does is help you decide whether or not the population mean for one of these samples differs from the other. So for example, for this plot, sample 2, it, the values tend to look uh, a little bit higher than the other ones. Is it substantially higher? Is it, can we conclude that sample 2 came from a population mean that is indeed different than the population means for samples 1, 3, and 4? To demonstrate the analysis of variance, I've written a computer program that samples from a normal distribution values for the four different samples. So I'm randomly selecting values for sample 1, for example, that are more likely to be concentrated at the center of this normal distribution, and, and it's possible to grab values further away from the mean value, but it's, it's not as likely. In reality, you never get to see these bell curves. If we could see them, there would be no reason to run the analysis of variance. We would know right away that the population means for the four samples are identical. In reality, all you get to see are, are the data points that you measured in your study. With analysis of variance, we have a null hypothesis in which the population means for each of these samples, mu1, mu2, mu3, and mu4, are equivalent. And that's our null hypothesis. Analysis of variance will provide some evidence as to whether or not you could refute the null hypothesis. And the alternative hypothesis is that at least one of the sample means differs from the other one. So here's an example of a case in which the alternative hypothesis is true. In this case, mu3 differs from mu1, 2, and 4. Here's another example of where the alternative hypothesis is true. So in this case, all four of the means are slightly different, especially mu2, and analysis of variance will tell you whether or not either of these things are true. Remember, only one of the means for the sample population has to differ. One of the things a analysis of variance will return is, is known as a p-value, and a large p-value suggests that there is not enough evidence to refute the null hypothesis. A large p-value suggests that the population means for all four samples are identical. A low p-value provides sufficient evidence to refute the null hypothesis. It suggests that at least one of the sample means is different, and it provides evidence for the alternative hypothesis. So there's three main things that have to be true for the analysis of variance to be accurate. The first thing that we need to confirm is that the measurements for all four of the samples has to be approximately normally distributed. And the second thing is that the variance for all four sample populations, or the standard deviation of all four of them, have to be the same. So the spread in the data should be approximately the same for all four samples. And the third assumption is that each measurement collected is independent of one another. So in other words, if we look at this chart again, when I collected this measurement, it cannot influence the values of other measurements for either sample 1 or for any of these other samples. All of the values, we say, must be independent. Remember that an analysis of variance is not definitive. All it does is gives you the odds that one of the population means is different. For example, if we looked at these data set, it sure looks like the population mean for sample 4 is considerably different than the sample means for sample 1 and sample 2, for example. When you run the analysis of variance, what you'll get for this particular problem is a p-value equal to 0 0.007. So it provides a lot of evidence that there is indeed some difference between these. In reality, however, I gathered these data points based on normal distributions with the same means. So in this case, mu1, 2, 3, and 4 are identical. So in this situation, we actually made a type 1 error, which means we refuted the null hypothesis when we shouldn't have. So we said that the population means were different when in actuality they were not. 
To further illustrate this, I've written a computer program that will do multiple simulations in which the four population means are identical. It will return, for each simulation, it'll return the p-value, and if the p-value is less than about 0.05, it suggests that the population means are different. And in this case, we know that the population means are identical. So the p-value is less than 0.05, the simulation will tell us that a type 1 error is made. It sums up the number of runs that we've made and the total number of type 1 errors. In this case, I've set alpha equal to 0.05, so if the p-value is less than 0.05, remember, it means we've made a type 1 error. So this means for every 100 runs, we would expect 5 type 1 errors to occur. So here in the first simulation, our p-value of 0.5, we would not refute the null hypothesis. We've not made a type 1 error. Here's run 2, a p-value of 0.9, and I'll continue. Run 4, it, was almost, it almost suggests it was different, but 0.06. Here's an instance in which we've made a type 1 error. The p-value of 0.04 is less than 0.05. It suggests that perhaps if we looked at this without the bell curve, we might infer that sample 2, the population mean for sample 2, is larger than the population mean uh, for sample 4, for example. So there's 20 runs, and one time out of 20, we would expect a type 1 error, which is indeed the case. And I'll keep running this up to 100 runs, and we'll see how close to five type 1 errors we end up making. So in this particular round of 100 simulations, I've actually made 10 type 1 errors. And remember, it's just on average that we'll make f uh, 5 type 1 errors. So if, if I ran 1,000 runs, for example, it's, it's highly likely that we'll get something closer to 50 type 1 errors. So here's what I got after I ran a, a second set of 100 runs. I get only 2 type 1 errors. And when I do it again, in this case, I came up with six type 1 errors. So on average, it's, it's about five type 1 errors for every 100 runs of this simulation. If I changed alpha to 0.01, then I, on average, I would get uh, about one type 1 error for every 100 runs. And if I set alpha equal to 0.1, I would, on average, I would get 10 type 1 errors for every 100 runs. Here's a simulation in which I made the population mean for sample 3 higher than the means for samples 1, 2, and 4. The p-value that I get is uh, a little over 0.1. So in this instance, we would not refute the null hypothesis when we should have. And we know from the simulation that the alternative hypothesis is true, yet we fail to refute the null hypothesis. In this case, we've made what's known as a type 2 error. When the population mean is subtly different from the other, and when the standard deviations for each of the sample populations is relatively large, you're less likely to refute the null hypothesis when you should have, and you're more likely to make a type 2 error. When I reduce the variance for each of the sample populations, reduce the standard deviations, we're much less likely to make a type 2 error. We're more likely to refute the null hypothesis. So as I cycle through these, we'll see very, very low p-values. And it's more and more evident that one of the sample means is different. And in this case, we know the sample mean for sample 3 is different. However, it's still possible that we'll make a type 2 error. For example, here, a p-value of 0.07, we would not have refuted the null hypothesis when we should have. As I continue to decrease the uh, standard deviations for each sample, the p-value becomes smaller and smaller. As I make the population mean for sample 3 further and further away from the other ones and decrease the standard deviation, the p-value becomes exceedingly small, and there's a great deal of evidence to refute the null hypothesis. The p-value is even smaller if I reduce the population mean for more than one sample. So in this case, the p-value is negligibly small. We're almost certain that the null hypothesis should be refuted. As a final note, why run an analysis of variance at all? Why don't we just do a series of two-sample t-tests so we could compare, for example, sample 1 and sample 2 with a t-test, sample 1 and sample 3, and sample 1 and sample 4, and then compare sample 2 and 3 and 2 and 4, and then compare samples 3 and 4. 
well, besides being more tedious from running all of these two sample t-tests, it's actually much less robust than using an analysis of variance. Because if you remember, it's not an exact test. So it might be that when we run these six different tests, there's a 5% chance that we'll refute the null hypothesis when we shouldn't have. And that 5% chance gets compounded over the six different two sample t-tests that we've run in this case. So you're much more likely to refute the null hypothesis when you shouldn't have. And in this case, it, it's better to run an analysis of variance because you're only running one test and that the type 1 error won't compound itself.